Hello and welcome to Stampscaping 101. This is the book, Rubber Stamping for the First Time. It was published in 1999, so quite some time ago. But it goes into the basics of everything you wanted to know about rubber stamping back in those days, including the types of, uh, you know, accessories out there to utilize with your stamps, how to color your stamps, how to clean your stamps, how to get a watercolor look, using pens with your stamps, which is what I'm doing right here. Okay, I've just laid down some um, dark brown dye-based inks on the covered bridge stamp here, and I'm blending in to some of that brown, this um, kind of olive green color here. We'll go into it with some uh, of this brilliant yellow. It's a little bit of an orangish yellow, and I'm blending some of those colors directly into the colors that we've already laid out and that should give us kind of a variety of uh, kind of color transitions throughout this piece and at least that's what I'm hoping for. Sometimes you don't really quite know exactly what you're going to get when you do that uh, process but you usually get some uh, nice uh, multicolored impressions this way that are inherent on the design itself instead of having to depend on doing all of that post-impression, okay? Sometimes people just stamp out black and then they color in, but it's nice having those colors just inherent in the impression itself. It saves you some time afterwards. Okay, we're going for some uh, deciduous fall foliage here, okay? And then we're doing the same type of uh, watercolor types of, uh, oh, I don't know, applications of uh, ink here, okay? And this is a very solid style of image right here, so you can't stamp that out and then color those, you know, give it those fall tones. So what you want to do is you want to get those tones right in the impressions themselves. Now you can, you can just do these in whatever colors you want, orange, red, whatever, and just go for a one monotone impression, and then you can stamp it in different colors as well. But if you want that variety of colors just directly in the single impression, then you'll need to uh, do some blending directly on the stamp like this. And you get some, uh, I don't know, some really different looks this way and a lot of variety, which is really fun. All right, so then see those leaves are really kind of turning there. And it looks really natural. I'm doing four compositions right here. Okay, this is the sedge filler that I'm filling out that road with. And then we'll move right into some reeds down there in the lower left-hand corner. And I've done those reeds in both green, and then I've stamped them in black to get a little bit of depth in that space. Now I'm doing four compositions for four different types of finishes uh, that we'll utilize in, uh, on these pieces in accordance with the um, instructions from the book as far as basic coloring techniques, okay? So they're talking about chalks here, but I didn't have any chalks, so I'm going to use this unopened pack of pastels that I've had for, I don't know, I, I'm guessing that these are probably 25 years old. I have no idea where I got them from. I'm kind of wondering if they were a, a prize that I won in a raffle at a, a store opening. Okay, so this is the way that I'm going to handle these pastels. I have not used chalks or pastels on a scene. I might have done it once. I think I tried pastels once um, on a dark piece of blue paper. It seems, uh, sounds kind of familiar. I think I had an example of one, I don't know, it might be 30 years ago. But I really haven't done a lot of dry media before, okay? I've seen a lot of uh, things chalks were really popular uh you know and when people were applying them with those little it looked like a q-tip but it was like a little foam applicator people were using chalks a lot back in the i would say it was in the late 90s maybe early 2000s chalks were really big in fact some stores that carried stampscapes that taught classes in them some places never used inks to color um, they used inks to stamp out their imagery, but they didn't do any uh, dye-based inks to color in, which most people were doing, but some places just used chalks. Okay, so here's my concept with the, pa uh, the pastels here. Pastels are kind of, 
they're translucent to opaque for the most part okay it depends on how thick of a, a layer you lay down with them when i'm dealing with opaque or semi-opaque um, media i'm usually working from dark colors and then i'll work into my lighter ones okay if i'm working with transparent media i'm usually going light to dark okay so my concept here is if i lay down the darker tones right here then i can build up um, the, uh, the lighter values right on top of them because the lighter ones will show up over the dark okay if you're working with transparent colors you know if you put down a black and you put a light blue over the top of it that blue uh, or the black is going to show right through it okay but that being said I'm not applying a very thick or you know hard you know firmly applied um, amount of these um, initial colors right now I'm kind of being conservative about it first of all because I've never used these before on a scene I'm not talking about just this pack I'm talking about not using chalks or pastels like in my life okay so I'm being a little bit conservative here and one of the things that I'm finding is that not all pastels even if it's in the same brand okay are the same um, hardness okay now I'm using a silk coated paper so it's pretty smooth it's really fantastic for stamped imagery because it is so smooth but smooth surfaces aren't great for things like soft media like pastels chalks you know colored pencils etc but this one has enough tooth to it enough texture even though you can't really see the texture but uh, these chalks will have enough to grab onto now i'm going to spray this when i'm done okay um but uh you know some of these harder pastels just weren't applying at all so i had to kind of move on to a a softer one that would apply um, better okay so i'm moving through uh, my different transitions here and i'm kind of gauging things like value you know light to dark and intensity and i just thought eh, it looks a little bit kind of anemic so i'm going into this kind of brighter um, kind of a lime green here and I'm applying it in the trees and on the ground cover. And see, here's the thing. I'm not trying to keep it out of the browns or anything like that, too. I'm just applying kind of a light version of it. And I'm doing some blending on the surface here. So here I'm trying to get... Oops! See, I snapped my uh, pastel in half. Believe me, you know, I'm not joking when I tell you I haven't used these before. And I haven't, you know done a lot of practice and you know there it goes i you know i snapped the uh the pastel so here i'm kind of going with a kind of a more uh front grip of the pastel so that you know i won't snap another one if you snap one then no big deal you know i mean i i did use um like things like charcoal you know when i was in school um you know for life drawing and drawing classes and whatnot uh, but that was all in black, you know. I don't know if we we might have used white too, but it was mostly black and uh, white uh, for things like life drawing, maybe some Conte crayons and whatnot. But I was never really um, very good at um, soft media. Okay. So, anyways, <laughs> see, that? I'm using my finger to kind of uh, blend with here. Going back in, now I'm using the lighter tone over the top of it. The lighter tone, right, on this type of paper wasn't very effective. I am getting a little bit of a light color over those trees, um, but not too much, okay? But overall, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way this looks here, um, you know, for my first try, especially... Um, um, kind of the the speed at which you can get a lot of coverage is really fantastic with um, pastels I mean they're not great for detailed work here I am uh, I'm taking the uh, little cotton swab and adding that in or I don't know I, I maybe I've removed too much of it with that cotton swab so going back in with a darker tone I'm getting a little bit bolder here okay 
um, as I start using it, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable and uh, comfortable with the application, but also with the notion of how much I can remove if I don't like it. Okay, here we go with this dark green. I think this dark green didn't apply at all. Yes, it's it's like nothing is being applied. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so some areas where maybe I didn't, uh, you know, there isn't so much of an impression with the ink maybe it applied. I don't know. Okay. Let's see, what do I do here? Oh, the little blue in the water here. Okay, now one of the things, watch the, um, see that, uh, the covered bridge? In all of my areas, okay, main areas, the water right here, even though it's small, it's still a pre pretty significant um, kind of player in the overall visuals of the thing. But do you notice how I left a little bit of light in that water? Okay. So then we let's look at the road now, okay? There's darker areas of the road, but I've left some areas a little bit lighter. I think I'm pointing to that right now, okay? So that's white right there. <laughs> I wanted you just to be able to compare some of the white there. Okay, so... The covered bridge, that's a pretty significant visual in the piece. Notice the rooftop is lighter than the sides. The road is lighter in some areas and darker in others. The water is darker in some areas than others, okay? So that's the way that you color for lighting or you develop lighting at the same time that you're coloring. You just retain some areas of light, okay? It's not hard to do. You just don't fill everything in. I don't know. People find that hard, but I get where that's coming from because they're used to filling in whole things. So they're saying, okay, sky, it's all blue, so they fill it on all blue. Okay, the covered bridge is brown, so they fill it in kind of mono value, all brown, and it's the same brown. Instead of retaining some areas that are a little bit darker or a little bit lighter, you know, the lightness of the, you know, the paper or whatnot, okay? All right, so in that area of my sky, it's a very pale um, blue, but I did retain kind of that center area, a little bit more of the white. And if I didn't, I could just wipe it off, being that these are, you know, pastels too. But it's just, you know, it's less work if you just retain some of that lighter area to begin with. Okay, now I'm trying to define more of the lighter areas going back in with the white here, the white pastel, you know, to some effect, but... I don't know. It works better in some areas. I'm looking at my hands here. I haven't had those kind of chalky hands in quite some time. All right, but that is the pastels. I'm deciding, okay, let's go in with a little bit more intensity in some of the areas. Um, yeah, that grassy area down there could use a little bit of a kind of pops of intensity, okay? So I'm not filling in the whole thing. I'm just kind of doing a little scribble of some of that, uh, you know, more intense color here and there, okay? So just don't color in everything uniformly, and what you'll do is you'll color and you'll light your scene at the same time. You don't have to do anything additive so much, you know, with the lights. You just have to retain because the lightness of the paper is already there. All right, so that is my first um, pastel piece. Uh, maybe ever, I don't remember. I had some other pastels somewhere. I don't know where they went. I think they were from school, and I don't know, maybe they were all little stubs or something like that, but I don't know. I, I was pretty happy with this, um, kind of the overall process. Okay, moving into colored pencils. Now, I have done colored pencils before, but I only started doing them really, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year ago. I have dabbled with them once in a while before. Okay, now what I do, this is what I always recommend to people, if you can, is to grab out the colors that you plan on using on your piece and make it visual for you, okay? Meaning I'm just putting them right in front of me. So I have a range of kind of yellows and oranges, and I have a range of light green, medium green, darker greens right there. And then the brown tones, okay? Now what I'm doing with these colored pencils, because they're a little bit more transparent than they are opaque. Now, I mean, if I do lay down a really thick application of colored pencils somewhere, it can be quite opaque, but I don't really use my colored pencils that way. 
I kind of build up through lighter tones and I just kind of develop things like that. It's just a very conservative way to approach things and it's, I don't know, it's a safe way to do it. Especially if you're someone that, you know, like me, that hasn't used some media very much. I apply in a very light coat at first, you know, because you can always add more. Okay, now I'm just showing you where the um, the covered bridge is darker in the design itself. I've designed the covered bridge to be to have some tones in there, um, darker areas, lighter areas, and then you can follow suit when you start coloring it in. Okay, okay, now watch this on the road. I'm coloring in some areas and I'm applying more of this brown in some areas. Okay, so I'm varying my road slightly. I'm putting kind of a, in this one, I'm putting kind of a darker area right in the middle of it as you move up there. So kind of more in the distance, it's a little bit lighter and the closer area is a little bit lighter. Okay. So this is kind of setting the stage for my lighting scheme. Okay. Now I'm not trying to stay right on the road. I'm taking that brown into the grass um, off the sides like I'm showing, you know, where some lighter areas are with that. Okay. So I didn't get a full kind of um, value scheme using that one color. Now I'm just changing hue here to get a slightly different brown and I'm following that lighting convention that I established with that previous one, okay? So as you move through and move into these darker tones um, of brown on the road, remember to retain some of that area of light. Now see that area on the, the side of my uh, covered bridge? If you darken in the side of the covered bridge and leave the rooftop lighter, then it looks like it's being top lit. Okay, so you've suddenly created light. But I'm not just leaving it all uniform, okay? I, I just have various areas, so the side of the covered bridge is darker than the roof, right? But there's also variation in the side of the bridge, and that it creates just variety. It's visual variety. And so... Uh, it can potentially create um, kind of a richer surface area when you have variation like that. So I am working through colors, but for the most part, I'm kind of thinking light and dark whenever I'm working in various colors, okay? And that keeps things really easy. I don't have to get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, what color can, you know, does this have to be? I'm just kind of thinking, okay, this is light brown, darker brown, medium brown. And, uh, I don't know, you're thinking of variation just retains some areas of light and, uh, you know, you'll be looking really good with your colors, uh, with your lighting schemes and color schemes, okay? Because your color schemes are going to be different too. You're creating a variety of, uh, intensity through the use of how much you use of those colors, okay? All right, so that's the brown. Now let's go in with some of the greens. Okay, so I'm starting off with this light green and applying it. It's a pretty yellow green, so it's a warm green right there. And see, it's a really just a very light version of it. It's like a pastel version of that green, okay, because I'm just applying it very lightly. I'm going into some of my road with it. You know, I'm not worried about if I take a little bit of that green into my covered bridge, that's no big deal because I'm putting a very light version of it down, okay? All right, so I'm moving into a medium tone one. And I'm going to leave some variation in that ground cover area. I won't color everything. So it's kind of like scribbling around um, in painting. They call it scumbling uh, when you don't color in something just solidly and you're just kind of creating variation, okay? So in something like ground textures, you know, with like clumps of bushes and whatnot that are growing on the side, you want some variation in there. And there is shadow areas in the design. So I'm just kind of darkening, darkening some of those shadow areas that are already in the design. So you don't have to invent it. So I'm just showing you right there what I'm doing in that area, okay? instead of coloring entirety when I move into these darker colors. See, I'm kind of just adding it right here and there in those shadow areas. Now see how um, varied the surface is starting to look? 
And see that right there? I took some of that into the road. That way you create continuity between that grassy area and uh, the brown area, okay? Some of the brown is in the green, and some of the green is in the brown. Um, it's not hard, okay? I mean, look at that. I took some of that green right into that brown right there of the bridge, okay? I mean, what this does is allows us to really kind of break, uh, I don't know, the, the borders of certain types of things. A lot of people have come up through the use of outline designs where you do not put one color into the other quadrant or whatever, okay? But that's not what we do in kind of scenic stamping. You want to kind of bring continuity to everything. So you blend colors um, with their kind of neighboring um, objects, okay? Which means you don't have to stay within the lines, actually kind of breaking out of the lines and blending things um, is good. So you, I don't know. The thing that's hard for people is breaking habits, okay? Now see, so I'm bringing some of this blue right into the road right there, okay? It's actually an easier process than kind of being really meticulous, okay? But if you're kind of used to being very meticulous, then it's a little bit hard. Okay, now this is the pastels. This is what kind of shocks me. I don't think these look too much different, and they can't be di more different uh, mediums. One's very general and very soft, and one's sharpened wax, you know, for the most part. So, I don't know, that kind of surprised me. Okay, markers. Now, the markers they're talking about in this book are Tombos and La Plumes, the double-sided dye-based markers. I don't have those. I have alcohol markers, so that's what I'm using here. Okay, now, alcohol markers or dye-based markers are transparent, okay? So what I'm doing with transparent types of media is, again, I'm working from light tones to darker tones. Now, it might not look like, look like I'm applying anything, okay? But that's a very, very light color. Now look at this blue. That is really light. But that's as light as it is. It's not dry, okay? So you can see, when you start working with, you know, a very light color, there's almost nothing you can do wrong, okay? Because you can barely see it. But you're asking, well, then why are you using that if you can barely see it? Well, what it's doing is it's establishing a little bit of a, kind of a surface, um saturation of that ink, okay? And I can kind of see, I kind of establish in a very light way the lighting scheme of the scene, okay? In a very light tone. So if you're not certain about a lighting scheme, then establish it where you can barely see it and then see if you like it. And if you don't like it, then it's not a big deal because it's not a big commitment to um, the values that are established there, okay? So I'm just showing here kind of um, ways to go about, or kind of approaches to um, uh, use your pens here, okay? So here's some different strategies right here. I'm darkening the side of the covered bridge, right? And then see, that's another side of it, the front of it, so I'm going to color that a little bit differently. But I did use some of that in the shadows. Now that was almost a little bit too light, so I'm going back to this other one or a little bit too dark to, uh, as a pen. I like to kind of approach things a little, much more gradually, okay? So that's my bridge right there. See where I've left the rooftop lighter? Now I'm going in with a little bit of a darker one here. But there are shadows being cast on the roof, you know, so I make some of it a little bit darker. And here's the same color being used in the green foliage, okay? So I'm not just using it on the covered bridge, but I'm bringing it throughout the other things. Now, I'm not going to do that with a super dark brown or something like that, but kind of a lighter brown, you know, that was a, I think, a brownish gray or something that's called. Um, that didn't leave too much of a mark, but again, it's creating that continuity. Okay, now this is a pretty dark brown here, so I'm going to go back in with my lighter one and kind of blend that out, I think. See how light that is. Or, no, maybe this is the pale green that I'm using. You can barely see it, right? But that's a good way to approach it, though, because it's just a color that's barely visible in the color scheme that you want to utilize 
on those objects or in the area, okay? Now, people always say I make it look easy. Well, it's because I use easy techniques. Um, if you use something that's going to leave a very significant mark um, that maybe or may not blend out, that's hard. But when you build it through these really light tones, it's really easy. It's like if you need to get to 100 or something like that, if you make jumps going from 25 to 50 to 75 to 100, you know, and you do it in four steps, that's going to be a little bit more precarious, right? You can do it, but it's more precarious. But instead, I'm going from like one, two, three, four, you know. In terms of values, I'm just making things a little bit darker as I go, okay? If you have the pens, and these days, pen sets, um, there are cheap pen sets like in alcohol markers. My, I have an 88 color set. Uh, not these ones, not the Laplumes. These are about $2 a pen. Um, but the Shuttle Art ones are 88 pens, and it cost me $40, okay? Okay, so filling this out. I'm do kind of doing that little scumbling type of thing that I did with the colored pencils, but doing it with the pens here now, okay? Now, every time I go in with kind of a darker color, I kind of blend it out with a lighter one again. Or you can go in and do it, you know, blend it out with your blender pen, but I usually use colors um, to do my blending. I just go back with a lighter one over the top of the color that I'm uh, blending out. So if I'm blending a dark blue, then I'll use a light blue. Okay, trying to define um, some of those uh, trees in there. I have yet to address that big open area of the road, but I'll get to that shortly. Larger areas are kind of, um, you know, you have to use a little bit more touch or whatnot, or more ink to get it blended in pretty well because it's just a big open area, okay? My, the textures that I'm getting in the imagery are kind of obscured a little bit or hidden by the textures um, in the stamp design itself. Okay, so I've laid down some of that brown. Remember how I'm going into that brown or that road on all of these different techniques. I'm kind of having an area that's lighter and an area that's darker on the road. Okay, so we can get that variation. By and large, I like to leave my visual lead-ins such as roads or paths or rivers or something like that i like to leave them lighter because it kind of creates this welcoming type of um, visual for the viewer when you're doing scenes you're kind of transporting the viewer of your scene into that location kind of on a subconscious level and from an emotional level if you have this kind of illuminated pathway, you really feel inclined to enter that, you know, follow that pathway, right? Not quite the yellow brick road, but if something was, um, some pathway was like super dark, you know, and it moved into a darker area, it's not quite as inviting as a kind of illuminated area, okay? that you want to follow, okay? So that's why I leave that lighter. It invites the viewer into the piece. Okay, now I'm doing some little dotting right here just to get some, kind of some textures into the, uh, the colors that I've already laid down, all right? And for a road like this, having some texture would actually be perfect, right? A lot of people like to have completely smooth applications of their inks. They ask, oh, does it streak, okay? And that's for kind of outline styles of designs where you want to have these, you know, completely machine looking <laughs> applications of colors sometimes. But I prefer textures, okay? So getting that texture down in a road like this is actually very conducive for the overall look. All right, going back in with that blue, see I'm leaving some of that little area of uh, the water a little bit lighter just for that variation in that blue um, I don't know, blue zone. All right, now that is the markers right there, okay? I think a good combination would be to do the um, pastel 
skies, but maybe the marker below or markers and colored pencils. Okay, so this is doing a little comparison right here between the three so far. They, they don't look as different as I thought they would. Okay, watercolors. Boy, this is something that I don't think I've ever done before. Um, on scenes, at least, okay. I've used watercolor paints in school. I was never good at it. And I have like three or four tubes of like 35-year-old watercolor paints. But I don't want to use those because I have like sepia and black and, I don't know, cadmium or something like that. So I thought I would break out these Derwent uh, watercolor pencils and try them for the first time. Okay, so what I'm experiencing with some of these pencils, or will be, just like the uh, pastels, is that some of these colors are harder than others. Okay, now this is my first one that I'm utilizing here, so I didn't know that. And these are brand new, okay? But just like those pastels, it's brand new. I've never used them, or I've never done it before, but I'm not talking about I haven't done anything with that set of pastels or these watercolors. I've never done any you know, like watercolor scenes before, okay? Now, this is kind of cheating a little bit, you know, because I, I, you know, I have used colored pencils over this last year, and I'm utilizing them that way here, but I've never gone into the kind of the watercolor, um, water-soluble um, utilizations of these pencils before. So this is going to be something that's completely new for me. And uh, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know how wet to have my brush when I was applying on, on it on here. I didn't know what the colors were going to look like when I did it. Nothing, okay? But, I don't know, it's kind of fun to play around and kind of exciting to find out. It's a little bit of a trepidation, sure, but, um, you know, without that, it's, I don't know, we wouldn't have the excitement, so... It's a little different for me, too, doing this, because I'm doing it kind of on video. <laughs> but here, I'm utilizing the same kind of process, okay? I'm utilizing some, you know, some medium tones, and I'm using this in kind of a lighter touch, okay? Because we can always apply thicker. But here's what, here's what occurred to me while I was doing this. I'm kind of approaching it like colored pencils, but I realize that I've got to, you know, increase my um, kind of application of these if I'm going to be dissolving some in water. You know, I need some media laid down on here in order for it to even show. You know, I don't want to apply kind of an anemic, thin layer of these uh, this media on here and then go back in and try some watercolor types of effects on it and you know not being able to see anything happening so I'm trying to go a little bit thicker here I don't know if you can tell on this video but kind of I'm working a little bit faster and a little bit harder here because I thought okay you know we need to get some of those washy kind of watercolory looks on here so you know let's uh Let's not chicken out here. <laughs> All right, this is some blue. Okay, I'm utilizing some of that in my grasses. You know, blue is a component of green. Oh, no, that's green there. Okay, I thought I was using some of the blue. But now I guess this is a little bit of a darker green here. I'm kind of getting a little bit more comfortable. You know, this is like the fourth medium here in this... Uh, book here, so kind of working with, uh, I don't know, the fourth one that's a little bit different. Remember, I'm kind of working in the same type of process, though, building it up gradually from light, you know, to dark or dark to light if I can remove it, okay? I think this is black here. I didn't use black in my previous ones, but I thought, eh, let's go ahead and use it on here just to get I don't know, like I said, some darker uh, variation and some media that I can dissolve, you know, with the, uh, with the water when I use it in here. All right, so let's see. Yeah, I'm looking at that road. It needs a little bit more. 
I'm being much more kind of expedient with each color as I go over it. Oh, this is a really light tone here, so maybe I was just trying to smooth out some of those um, colors that I already laid down. Now remember, this is not the ideal surface for these types of uh, pencils. Um, having something with a little bit more tooth to it would be better. Um, this is a very smooth surface. Okay, now here's what I'm kind of wondering about. Can I go with these pencils in the sky and then dissolve it in water? Because those are dye-based inks that I stamped out the uh, the leaves with, so I, I was worried about those kind of bleeding um, if they weren't, you know, pretty firmly affixed in the surface. Okay, so those leaves had a kind of overnight to dry, but they're dye-based inks. They're water-based inks, and if I put water right over the top of them, I think they're going to bleed. So I decided, you know, let's just give it a try. Now, the ideal thing would be is if you laid down these watercolor paints in the background first, then you do your watercolor types of touches with it, and then, you you know, when that dries, then you stamp the leaves over it. Okay, that would have made more sense. Okay. But I, I don't know. I wasn't thinking about that, uh, you know, when I did these here. So, I don't know. Maybe I was thinking about it and hoping. <laughs> All right. So, bringing some of this down into the surface right here. This is the blue, right? I can't even see. Uh, oh, no. This is a little bit more of that. Oh, this is a terracotta. It's a little bit more of a reddish uh, brown. I thought it, I thought things were looking a little too anemic, okay? So I, I wanted to bring more of that reddish uh, tone into the scene. I end up coloring a lot more of the uh, the road with this uh, with these colors than I anticipated. But here's what I was thinking. I was thinking that if I go into it with water, I can pro I would probably be lifting some of that media off of the surface. So I thought, okay, let's go a little bit more than what I would normally do. Um, that was my, I don't know, that was my hypothesis at least, as far as what was going to happen. I didn't know, especially on this type of paper. So yeah, keep that in mind too, you know. I mean, this, these types of touches and kind of techniques are going to look different on paper that's more conducive for the medium, okay? All right, so that's what we have right there. I think it looks, you know, halfway decent for like a colored pencil type of uh, application of color. But, okay, I had yellow in that brush. I didn't want that yellow in there. I don't know, I used it on... I have no idea what I used that brush for before. But it had that ink in there. Okay, so this is just a, kind of a wide brush... And I had no idea how wet I should have it, so I started removing some of it. And I started taking it on there. I think I was using too much water, especially for never having used it before. I, I started applying it like this, and I thought, oh, that's really blending that color out and dissolving a huge amount of it right there. So I started doing a much more of a kind of a dry brush effect. I do like the look at that... Uh, that covered bridge, though, just with that first kind of uh, blending out. Okay, now here's where it gets a little bit precarious here. When I start going into some of those leaves, they really started to uh, to bleed or just kind of to bleed out of their forms, okay? Not quite yet, but here's a little bit more of that. Uh, to, now see those trees right there? it's starting to get a lot of that yellow out of there. So I'm kind of removing some ink with this, uh, you know, at this point. And uh, I don't have a lot of control over it, but I start getting a little bit more control using um, a drier application, okay? And I'm using that kind of paper towel to mop up some areas. Okay, so we're taking it down here on the... Uh, path. I'm being a little bit more conservative here, but there it goes. I didn't, I just didn't realize just how fast, um, at least this brand of watercolors goes back into solution on this paper, okay? So remember, this paper is very, um, it's very smooth and somewhat sealed, so the watercolor pencils aren't 
you know, working down into like grooves in the paper. So I think, you know, that really kind of expedited the whole kind of uh, dissolving of surface media with the water, okay? Uh, you know, with this particular uh, uh, silk paper. All right, but I do like that look there, you know, alongside that road, kind of that watercolory look. Now, what I'm doing right here is within that kind of ground texture, it got a little bit too monotone, mono value. So I'm going in here with a wet brush and I'm removing some of that media to make it a little bit lighter in some areas. And as I'm doing this now, um, what's occurring to me is some areas are starting to look a little bit too soft, okay? Because that's, you know, that's the, the spirit of watercolors. You want it to look soft. It's, you know, it's not meant for details, okay? So what I did here, seeing that grassy area underneath the, uh, the covered bridge, you know, alongside the road, it got a little bit too soft looking. So I'm going back in here now with another of the um, watercolor pencils. And I'm bringing in some kind of more defined shadows into that area, not to kind of eradicate the colored pencil um, touches or the watercolor touches, but just to bring some contrast with some areas that are kind of sharp to contrast against the softness of the watercolored areas, okay? So going back in there like that and redefining some shadows here and there. Um, just kind of balanced out the uh, scene nicely. And one of the things that I think is going to look really great on these, I'm going to spray fix the, um, the pastel piece. And uh, on these other ones, I'm going to add my um, white pigment ink touches to give a kind of a feeling of fog and mist over these pieces. And I think that's going to contribute a lot to uh, kind of the overall look. But I just wanted to stick with what was in the book um, for this video. And I'll get to some of those other touches later. But I think the combination of some of these on a certain scene would look good. I don't know if I'll just do only, you know, pastels or only colored pencils or something like that. I'd like to work with mixed media to utilize the different media for their strengths. So pastels maybe for the sky and who knows, maybe watercolor and colored pencils down on the uh, areas down below on the objects. Okay, so those are the four pieces right there. They look pretty different, but not as different as I would have suspected considering how different the different uh, media, you know, mediums are from one another. So I don't know, it kind of surprised me in many ways. And uh, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed some of these uh, mediums that I've never used before. Okay, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.